Hey everybody, welcome to another Sunday morning stream from Journey. Now, the passage that we're in today, 1 John 3, verses 19 through 24, is awesome. And, and you can see from what I've put on the screen, get the peace and rest that comes with confidence today. Get it today. Um, I, this isn't an infomercial. And, and what I'm going to be sharing with you from this passage isn't like an infomercial where they show you all these benefits and things that may or may not be something you can get. I know for me one time, and I fall victim to good advertising, but, but one time I, I ordered uh, this, this fry pan that was supposed to be fantastic and uh, nonstick. And, and they showed in the, the infomercial a million different things that didn't stick to it. Well, I got the fry pan and guess what? Everything always stuck to it. You know, I, I enjoy cooking in cast iron and, and sometimes things stick a little bit to cast iron. I've got pretty good patina on ours, but uh, it, it, it still is better than that pan. <laughs> that was the worst purchase of my life. But what I'm going to share to you to, with you today uh, from 1 John chapter 3, verses 19 through 24 is, is not at all uh, a quick sell. Uh, something that uh, just gives you the benefits without making them accessible to you. And, and the reality is the last two messages I've given um, from 1 John, both 1 John 3, 4 through 10, uh, this is where he talks about the importance of, of obedience. Uh, if, if you say you love the Lord, but you're not obedient to anything he asks, one has to question, are you really his? It's a fair question, uh, but it can also put some pressure on the believer. You can start looking at your life and thinking, well, I failed here, I failed here. Oh, am I? And, and the point of this wasn't for John to shake your confidence. The point of John writing this in, in 1 John 3, 4 through 10 is to encourage you as a believer to become mature and start to look around you and, and decide to be obedient. And, and that's one of the ways we grow by seeing that the Holy Spirit empowers us to be obedient. And, and so it's, it's this kind of a, a loop of encouragement, not discouragement. Uh, and then last week, 1 John uh, chapter 3, verses 10 through 18. And, and it, here was the topic, obedience must be done in love. Uh, you can be obedient, but if you're just following the law and you really don't love God and love your neighbor, your obedience is kind of meaningless. And, and so John points out these two pressure points for the believer. Listen, if you're a believer and you don't love the Lord and you don't love others, I have to question if that's true. If you're a believer and, and you don't have any obedience to the Lord and you just continue to sin and live the way you used to live, there's no change in your life. Now, are you really his? Uh, John says these things, but, but today, this Sunday, in, in 1 John 3, 19 through 24, there's a payoff. And, and this is where John says, listen, I hope I've gotten your attention and you're trying to be obedient. I hope I've gotten your attention and, and you're considering the love that should be in your heart as a believer. Now, if you're considering both of these things, I, I need to give you some encouragement to keep going. Now, I'll tell you a quick story here as we get ready to jump in. When I was in seminary, I was married at the time. I was in my 30s. And, and uh, I did not want my, want my wife to think she married a dummy. My wife is very sharp. She did very well in school. She, had business, she has a business degree, and she handles a lot of the financials in our home because you don't want a theologian uh, start doing your, your finances. I, I'm not a numbers guy. I, I'm more of the passion guy. And, and, and my wife is very wise. Now, when I was in high school, when I was in college, she wasn't around. And, and I don't know that I was the most dedicated. Well, actually, I do know I wasn't the most dedicated student. But I didn't want to look dumb to my wife. And I certainly didn't want to spend all the money on seminary and, and have people second guess that. And I, I told the Lord and I told my wife I would try my very best. And for the first time in my life, I did. I studied. I memorized. I, I did everything on time. It was the first time in my life I ever did that. And I, I found out some of my professors were right. Some of my teachers were right. If I applied myself and, and turned in everything on time, it, it was amazing how much my grades went up. But also this happened. Once I started trying, I became really nervous about my grade I, grades. I became really nervous. When, when I wasn't trying, I really wasn't that nervous because I, I kind of hoped to get a C. I'm not a dummy. I, sometimes I had to figure things out on the fly. 
But there's not a lot of pressure when you're not trying because you can't expect to do that good. But when I was fully trying, th there was pressure and it was tough. And I had some sleepless nights along the way wondering how things would be graded. I remember there was one situation where I, I got a less than, than uh, good grade and I went and talked to that professor. Now, in, in uh, none other of my schooling would I have done this, but I went and sat and talked with him because I figured I, to get that bad grade, I must not have understood what he was asking. And he was honest with me. He was a fairly new professor at the seminary. And he said, you know, everybody messed that up. And when I talked to him, he said, Chris, I'm going to throw that out. We're going to start this over. We're going to make sure I'm explaining myself better because I, maybe a lot of people didn't know. You know, it uh, gave me a lot of, of peace and rest to, to be able to reconcile with that professor. But it was only because I was trying. And this is the, the passage we're, we're in today. This is 1 John chapter 3, verses 19 through 24, where John uh, says in, in the loving way he can, listen, if you've been trying, you're going to be a harsh judge of yourself. But remember who the Lord is. Remember where your confidence comes from in Christ. And remember the, the peace that the Lord wants to give to you. Now, before I jump into that passage, I want to read one thing. These are the words of Jesus in John 14, 27. Now, John was in his 90s when he wrote the Gospel of John, which I'm going to read to here. He was also in his 90s when he wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And he was an old man when he wrote Revelation as well. Some 25 years after the entire rest of Scripture was written, God inspired him. He was the last apostle alive. He had been a believer in Christ for over 60 years, longer than the other apostles because they had all been martyred. They were all gone. But God had, had kept him here for a purpose and now was speaking through him to a second, third generation that was, was coming along. And, and John wanted them to have the peace that the apostles had as they saw what Jesus did and experienced the resurrection personally and, and had that ability to be forgiven by Jesus and fully realize the love of God in them. Uh, this is what John wants. And, and in John 14, 27, he records these words of Jesus. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Your heart must not be troubled or fearful. You have heard me tell you I'm going away and I'm coming to you. If you love me, you would have rejoiced that I'm going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. I've told you now before it happens so then what does happen you may believe. Now, this is Jesus telling the apostles, uh, telling that at this point they're the disciples before they're sent out at the Great Commission and become the apostles. But uh, th this is when Jesus is telling them, listen, my peace I live, leave with you. And it is not the peace of the world. You know, God's peace is not like the peace of the world. I, I've had people come around the church before that are going through a job change or going through maybe a relationship change or maybe they're going through a divorce or they're going through some kind of change in life and they, they want some kind of peace. And the Lord's peace isn't like the world's peace. And if what they're seeking is the world's peace, I can't help. But if they have been trying to seek the Lord and trying to abide in him and trying to follow his ways and trying to love as he wants them to love, then I can help then I can help give peace. And, and that's the passage we're in today, 1 John 3, 19 through 24. I'm going to read through it. And I'm going to come back and, and do two verses, two verses, one verse, one verse, and make four points out of this passage. But before I jump into the first section, let, let me read this to you. 1 John 3, 19 through 24. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and we do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit. 
whom he has given us. You see, it starts in verse 19. By this we shall know that we are of the truth. By, by, John wants us to know, to have the confidence that we're in the Lord. And in verse 24, whoever keeps his commandments and abides in him is whoever makes a home with the Lord. You know, I, I've been in ministry a long time, and one thing I know is the Lord doesn't want you to live in uncertainty. He wants you to be certain. And he wants you to know every day, this is the moment, this is the time, this is the day to get right before him. You don't have to live in uncertainty before Christ. You can confess your sins, and he is faithful to forgive your sins. He doesn't give peace the way the world gives peace. The world gives and takes away and is all over the place. But God's peace is solid. And if you come to Christ, you can receive that. And when you start to feel shaken, you can receive it again. Well, let's jump in. Let's look at the first uh, two verses here. Uh, I put them on in the slide. 1 John three nineteen and 20. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. You know, like I said, when, when I was in school, sometimes I would be stressing. Do I really know all the answers? Do I really get everything right? Did I really, um, no, let me shut my fan off over here. Um, do I have this assignment fully? Did I understand what the professor wanted? Do I know what the Lord wants me to do every second? It can be very stressful when you're trying for the Lord, when you're wanting to grow in the Lord. Uh, at, at this, it, it says, um, we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our hearts before him. For whenever our heart condemns us. You know, there's a, an interesting word here. It's, it's condemn. And that's not the Lord's work. The, the Lord's work for the believer is conviction, not condemnation. And there's a difference between conviction and condemnation. Condemnation is kind of what Adam and Eve felt at first, where they wanted to run, they wanted to hide, they wanted to, to, to get away from the Lord. They wanted him not to see them. They were ashamed and thought they could clean up things on their own. That's not what we should do. You see, the Holy Spirit works in our hearts to convict us of sin. Uh, Jesus says in, in John 3, 17, that God didn't send his son to condemn the world, but through him, the world might be saved. It, it's not condemnation. It's salvation. But, but to get to that salvation, you have to be convicted. You have to turn from your way of living. You have to turn to, to Christ and say, I, my way was the wrong way, your way. Is, is the right way. Uh, sometimes our hearts condemn us. You know, so the scriptures call the devil a liar and, and the, con, the accuser of the brethren. He's the one that's trying to condemn you. Say, you'll never get it. You'll never get there. Why don't you give up? All you're trying isn't making you good enough. And here's the thing as a believer you may know that you don't want to live the way you used to live, but then people point out to you how awkward it is trying to be a believer when you've never been one before. You know, my heart always goes out to folks that didn't grow up in a Christian home because they don't know all the things to do and they're trying to be Christian-y and trying to act Christian and, and it can be tough. I remember one time I shared the gospel with a man and he received Christ. He prayed to receive Christ and he, he showed up for church and and I had handed him this Bible because he didn't have a Bible. And, and during the service, I, I said, well, let's turn to, and I think we we're in Galatians at the time. And, and I said, well, let's turn to that. And I, I saw him just kind of look at his Bible, open it for a second, shut it, and just kind of look at me. And I thought, Kenner, you're a jerk. This man has no idea where, where any of the books are. I, that week I, I went to the Christian bookstore and I got him Bible tabs and I met him for lunch and I said here and, and I helped him put those in his Bible. I showed him what the, the, the short version of the words were so he would know where to look and, and he was very happy with that. I needed to reassure him. 
I didn't want him to feel condemned. I want him to feel encouraged. And here's the thing. If you're trying, if you're growing, Lord, John is saying, listen, don't let your heart condemn you. D don't be the judge of yourself. Sometimes we, we start to judge our actions. And if we're striving to be obedient and, and our works don't save us anyway, our works also don't lose us. But, but if we're striving for obedience and we're striving to grow in the Lord, our heart shouldn't condemn us. I love this. It says in verse 20, for whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. The one who saved you is greater than you. And he's doing a work in you. And you may get frustrated that you're not growing enough, that you're not getting there, that you're not understanding enough. Nobody... <laughs> But he understood less than the apostles if he looked through scripture. They didn't understand a lot of things. But Jesus continually worked with them. I love how verse 20 ends. God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. You know, the Lord knows your weakness, your feebleness, your intentions, good or bad. He knows um, your insecurities. He knows your motives. You might as well come before the Lord honestly. Don't hide from him. Don't live in condemnation. But conviction, conviction says come to the Lord, turn to him and, and allow him to forgive you and lift you up and, and to make you whole. You know, the, the whole process here is that it's not about our goodness. It's always about his goodness, his grace, his peace, his mercy. Now, it doesn't mean we don't grow in him. It doesn't mean we don't try. But it does mean we aren't hard on ourselves and we're not hard on others. We need to be able to look at how we're growing in Christ and allow the Holy Spirit and the Lord to work with us to get there. Kind of like when I sat down with that professor and talked about the assignment. I wanted to get it right and he wanted me to get it right. He wasn't trying to condemn me or give me a bad grade. He was trying to help me learn. And together, we made an impact on that class that was helpful because he was able to come back a second time and try again. Now, sometimes the Lord continues to work with us until we get there. He's never the one making the mistake, okay? Every analogy has a breaking point. But I, I want to tell you, the Lord is trying to get something through. I, I love when, when Peter denied Christ. Well, I don't love that part. part. I love when Jesus came to him and reinstated Peter. Jesus said three different times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And, and you may want to look at this. I think it's John 21. Peter says to the Lord at the end, Lord, you know all things. What Peter was saying is, Lord, you know my heart. You know how sad this has made me. You know how I know this is a failure. Peter at the end of that said, Lord, you know all things. You know me. I think it's in, in Hebrews, um, I don't know if I wrote it down in here, but it, it talks about how our lives are open to the Lord in every way. That's Hebrews 4.19. Uh, our lives are before the Lord always. Some people think the Lord only sees us at church. You know, Shh, we're in the Lord's house. You know, you're equally in the Lord's house, in the Lord's presence, wherever you go. He deserves your reverence wherever you are at any second you are. I, I know that, that that couple that's in church acting all nice, but they were yelling at each other, screaming at each other in the car on the way there. But then they come into the Lord's presence, right? They were always in the Lord's presence. You're always in the Lord's presence. Now, we do better or worse. But the Lord, if he has saved us through his son, if we have turned to him and confessed our sins, he has been faithful to forgive them. And, and he continues to work with us. He knows everything. And that's the first thing I want to point out for these two verses that you and I need to always remember. The Lord knows everything and he weighs everything out. And he is the perfect judge of our hearts because he knows our every intention, our every motive, as I said, our every insecurity. He knows what's going on. And he's going to work out a plan to help us to continue to grow from A to B as we are in him. Sometimes we think we're not in him because something is messed up or we've gone a different direction. Don't live under con condemnation. Live under conviction that you need to run to the Father and let him sort it out. Because he knows everything.
Don't hide from him. That's the first step John's saying here. Listen, if if you're feeling a little judgy of yourself, like you want to condemn yourself, like you want to listen to the devil and just run off in a different direction, why don't you stay and ask the Lord for his judgment on your life? Because the Lord knows everything. And that should be comforting for the believer. That's not a discomfort. That's a great comfort. All right, let's look at the next two verses. Uh, John 3, 21, 22. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. Now, when I read this verse, you're, you're immediately going to track to that, that middle part in 22, whatever we ask, we receive. And, and you've heard people say, oh, you can get anything from the Lord if you go to him in the right way. Uh, if you think about the context of the two verses I just talked about, where this is going, this is talking about you Dealing with your own selfishness, dealing with your own condemnation, dealing with your own things as you're trying to grow in the Lord. And, and now verses 21 and 22 together talk about a confidence we can have. And, and that's where we ended in verse 20 there. It, it was talking about the Lord knows everything. And, and because he knows everything, he's the best one to judge the situation. And if you're in Christ, he's going to judge you to be in him. He's going to have grace for you not condemnation. His goal isn't to condemn you. It is to continue to save you as he's already saved you through Christ. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. Now, uh, verse 21 is very important. It, the goal is having confidence before God, not getting nitpicky about all the ways that we're falling short and, and, and crushing ourselves with all the details. I've had people come to me before with these crises of faith every few months. Uh, uh, I've had believers return to me. Well, I, th I think I'm not saved now because of this, or I think my wife is, is not saved because of this. And I, this, this lack of confidence in, in faith. One of the things over the years as a pastor that I don't do, I don't do investigative journalism where I'm looking through your life trying to figure out if you're a believer or not. When I've had people say to me, well, I don't think this person is a believer because of this and that, I just say to them, does the person profess to be a believer? I don't know. I cannot define. Scriptures even tell me that I can't tell the difference between the wheat and the tares. So we just harvest them both. We just work with them both. We just preach the gospel to both. And when the end comes, the Lord will sort them out. He knows. As I just said in the two verse four, he knows everything. He knows what's going on in your heart. He, you can't hide from him. And if you're practicing fake condemnation of yourself just to get encouraged by somebody because that feels good, uh, that's not mature either. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. We need to grow in him and let the Lord decide what he's doing with us and listen to him, be obedient to him. And, and, and I love this. This is talking about confidence. And if you have confidence in what Jesus has done for you, uh, whatever we ask, we receive from him. But here's the thing. If we're praying in obedience, if we're praying in his will, if we're abiding in him and he is abiding in us, and we're the whole meeting him and the Holy Spirit is working and, and, and we're working together for growth. You know what our prayers are going to be? Our prayers are going to be exactly what he wants to do anyway. Our prayers are going to be perfectly in line with the will of God. So, of course, he'll keep his word. Of course, whatever we ask, we'll receive because our prayers will be such that they'll be perfectly in line with his will. Now, you might think, uh, Pastor Chris, that's a, a huge goal, that, that my mind would pray exactly what the Lord wants to do anyway. And, and you might say also, like, well, what's the sense of praying then? What's the sense of praying then? You get to be part. You, you get to be part of what God is doing and cheer him on and encourage him, and he gets to encourage you because he's going to do the things you're praying about. If God's will for one of your coworkers is to become a believer and, and for you to be able to encourage them and you start living and abiding in Christ and through your life comes the power of God to help that person because they see the presence of Jesus in your life, God is going to rejoice because he doesn't want anybody to perish. And, and let's say that coworker is somebody who's not even a friend of yours. You don't even like them, but God still wants to bless them and he uses you, the most unlikely vessel in their life, to do it. That's an awesome prayer. 
And you get to be a part of that. And you get to see the Holy Spirit work. And you get to feel that achievement in your life that God used you. Whatever we ask for, we receive from him. We think of so many selfish things. It should not be a selfish thing. Because that's the overall conviction of our heart. Is that now we're living for the Lord. That's how self-centered we are that people read this in the wrong way. God's glory. And God's glory and his judgment. He knows everything. And the goal is confidence in him. And once we get confidence in him and his ways that they are good. And that he truly loves us. And that, that his presence in our life is giving us a solid foundation. Then the goal is confidence in him. And we start to have so much confidence. The confidence spills over in him into our prayer lives. And we are fully confident in our prayer life. That when we pray to him, we get to know his character. And we know what he's going to do. And we're excited about how he's going to work in his life and the power he has. And we switch over from being those Christians that act like God has no power to work in anything around us. To Christians who are really excited that every day we make up, when we wake up, God might use us today. The goal is confidence in the Lord. It's an amazing goal. Number one, God knows everything. He knows. And he knows you and he's the best judge of you. And if you're in Christ, he's judged you worthy and he's judged you to be his love and he's judged you to be in his family. And he's judged you to have confidence in him. And as you have that confidence in him, it's going to spill over in your prayer life that whatever you ask him for, he's going to do because you know him and you know what to ask him. And your will is aligning with him and that becomes a powerful thing to encourage you in your life. So let's move on. Third thing. This is just one verse now. 1 John 3.23. It says, And this is his commandment that we believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. You know, one of the things that I do sometimes, I'm not a great counselor. I'll meet with somebody once or twice, and I try to send them on uh, a lot of times to somebody else because I, I don't, I, I'm just not a good listener. I've had people yell at me that counselors are supposed to listen. I'm a preacher. I'm going to start talking at some point. But one of the key things I do in counseling is I try to refocus somebody's focus on what they can't control that maybe they're focused on to what they can control. You know, you, you can't control other people or get them to do things you want, but you can control your time and be in the word and spend time with the Lord. And, and you can change, but you can't change somebody else. And, and I always kind of go back to that refocusing their focus because nine times out of ten people are upset uh, because of something somebody else has done. And that's a great time to focus on, on what they can do. And how they can build and how they can grow. And and First John 3, 23, as we're going through this, it, it, if you're frustrated, maybe you're not the best judge of you. Maybe you need to turn over the judgment of your life to the Lord and listen to him and, and build your confidence in him. So you're praying in his will and not your own. And, and maybe, First John 3, 23, as we're going through this, you need to refocus your focus. And this is his command, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. Everything in this passage has been leading to this. God knows what you're dealing with, and he loves you, and he's trying to help you grow. So don't condemn yourself, and don't condemn somebody else. Continue to grow. Continue to, to grow in your confidence of what the Lord is capable of, and his power, and his mercy, and his grace. Continue. By refocusing your focus on the original thing you started with. And, and John says it here in 23. He says this is the commandment that we, number one, we believe in Jesus. And number two, that we love each other. And number three, we obey him. We follow his commands. It sounds like an easy list. But when we get all lost doing all this, well, maybe I didn't do this right, or maybe this, and we start parsing all the personal interactions, look through it, we lose focus on the big picture. And the big picture is this. You were saved by the name of Jesus, and that name will always save you. It was your salvation. It's your forever salvation to put you in the forever family of God. And, and now, because of that, you're called to love others and love the Lord and be obedient to everything the Lord asks you to do. It, it's not a bad deal. It's a good deal. But don't stray from it. 
The Gnostics in John's day had all this secret inside information, and and they had to tell you that to get you to grow in your faith. And what John says many times, he's kind of saying here, is is you don't need to know more. You need to go back to the original. The, The original thing you heard when you got saved was this, that you're saved by the name of Christ. You're saved in Jesus. And that now you're called to be a part of the church and love each other. And in the church, we're going to teach God's word and how you need to obey it. Because we all live under it. We're all people of his word, the Bible. This is a commandment that we believe in the the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. We need to refocus our focus back to the original focus. When I was 13, when I got saved, this was the original focus. It hasn't changed in my life. The veracity of it, the, the importance of it never changes. Refocus your focus. Get back to the basics. I don't know if you can hear my dog in the background. I've got a beagle. She's a little awake right now. Okay. Uh, and, and here's the last one. Here's number four. Uh, 1 John 3, 24. Whoever keeps his commandments abide in God and God in him. And by this we know he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. This is just talking about how do we live daily? How do we live daily without the crushing weight of judging everything? Well, this is how we do it. Uh, number one, we keep his commandments. We, we obey him. Number two, it says we abide in him. That, uh, and the word abide means to make a home with. We make a home with the Lord. As I said, not just at church. You're not just going to his presence at church or during a sermon or during a certain song or when you feel his presence. That's not when his presence is there. His presence is always there. Because for a believer, how can you be separated from the love of God? The scriptures tell us there's nothing that can separate you from the Lord. He knows everything. He's with you all the time. He's When you came to a, a life-saving knowledge of Jesus, he gave you the imprint of the Holy Spirit on you as a seal to seal you for the day of redemption. And what that means, that, that wax seal would be put in an envelope so nobody would open it until the person it was sent to uh, was to open it. So the Holy Spirit has sealed your life. Until Jesus opens it in eternity, forever. You are definitely going to be mailed to the Lord. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in him. You make a home with the Lord. And the Lord makes a home with you. And by this, we know that he abides in us. We know that he's made a home in us. Because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's how we daily live. By seeing and observing the Holy Spirit moving around in our lives. And the Holy Spirit tells us how to obey his commands, how to read scripture. It reminds us of scripture we've had and and seen. It it points out sin, illuminates sin in our lives, not in a condemning way, but in a convicting way. So we stop it. No real believer enjoys continuing in sin because the presence of our Holy Spirit in our lives is real. And, And let me tell you this. You can either go through your life trying to ignore the Holy Spirit or trying to listen to the Holy Spirit. I listen. I try to listen. And and I've learned two things over the years about listening. Listening takes two things. You have to lean in close if you want to listen right. And you have to be quiet. I know when my son was born, we had been through so much. And my wife was so nervous that something would happen that night. He was born. I got to cut the cord. We were in the hospital. And it was warm. And it was dark. And we were tired. And my wife said to me, my sweet wife, she said, somebody needs to stay awake and watch Paul to make sure he's breathing. And I know she just needs some sleep. We had been through so much. I said, honey, you, you lay down and go to sleep. I'll sit here and just watch him breathe. And, and it was dark in that room. I had to lean. I had to listen. I had to quiet my own breath to hear his. But, you know, after a while, I knew I was going to fall asleep. I was getting really tired. And I woke up my wife because I didn't want to be a liar. I didn't want her to catch me asleep. I woke her up and I said, honey, We both need to sleep. At some point, we're going to have to trust the Lord to watch over our son. We prayed together over Paul, and then we slept, and we let the Lord watch. Because I knew the Lord could lean in and listen to my son's breath. And he did. Paul's 10 now, by the way. (laughs) He's still breathing and, and having no problems eating. 
whoever keeps the Lord's commandments and makes a home with him, God will make a home with you. And he wants you to know, to know that you know that you know that you're fine. By experiencing the life-giving nature of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's daily living. It's not picking you apart, yourself apart for every sin and harassing yourself and others saying you're not worthy because you're not. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. And, and really, the whole reason I'm able to come back every week and teach something else from Scripture is because God is good and Scripture is great. And, and I know His consistency and His power and His perfection come through, not mine. I, I learned a long time ago, I'm not the best one to judge my life story. My job is to trust that the Lord is good and to let him judge it. And, and can I ask you on close, are, are you letting the Lord judge your life story? Are, are you trusting in his goodness and his peace and his mercy? I, I want to read you two scriptures here on close. One is Deuteronomy 28, 65 and 67. And, and I've been reading through the Old Testament, doing some Old Testament readings and and I, this really spoke to me in a, in a powerful way. And in Deuteronomy 28, 65 through 67, th this is um, the Lord kind of uh, speaking to the people and, and saying, listen, this is what it's like to live in the world. This is the uncertainty of the world. And I want you to hear this. It, it says, you will find no peace among those nations and there will be no resting place for the sole of your foot. There the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing eyes, and a despondent spirit. Your life will hang in doubt before you. You will be in dread in day and at night never certain of survival. In the morning you will say, if only it were evening. And in the evening you will say, if only it were morning. Because of the dread you will have in your heart and because of what you will see. Doesn't that sound like the world we live in today? And if you're living in the world, you have no peace, you have no confidence, you, you have no hope. But, but that's not the way the Lord wants you to live. The Lord wants you to live in confidence. He, he wants you to live in hope. Let me read one other passage for you. And this is Romans 8. Romans 8, 14 and, and 15. It says, all those led by God's spirit are God's sons. Doesn't that sound like we were just reading? experiencing the Holy Spirit in your life every day. All those who are led by God's Spirit are God's sons. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received a spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. You're in the family. And he abides in your home and you abide in his home forever. You, we are a forever family. You know, both of our kids are adopted and both of our kids are a part of our forever family. Genetics aren't as important as our family is love. And if genetics are more important to you than being a part of God's family, you've got a lot to learn. Because you were adopted through the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ into the very family of God. He sees everything you do. He knows all. And he wants to give you his peace. But his peace is not the Deuteronomy peace of the world where you live in constant fear wondering how you're going to get through. God's peace is, is great because you are a part of his family and his household. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You, you get the confidence to move forward and grow in the Lord. That you won't be condemned. But you'll be convicted, you'll be corrected, and you will grow in him. Not kicked out. I, I love this passage. And I love that passage in Deuteronomy. Because it shows the difference of how we live in the world. With all the fears of the world. And how we can live in Christ with the peace and the beauty and the love. Knowing the Lord knows all. So listen, if, if you're faking it today, don't fake it. The Lord knows. His goal for you is confidence. And that confidence should go all the way through to your prayer life. Where you have a rich and vital and meaningful prayer life when you talk to the Lord about things. And you see him working around you. And I pray that all the time for the folks of our church and folks that I know that I want you to grow in the Lord. And I want you to see him working so it encourages your confidence and your relationship with him. I want you to refocus and, and focus on him, focus on Christ, being obedient to Christ by listening to him, 
by remembering what saved you. And it was Jesus. It was not your acts. It wasn't your righteousness. It was confessing of your sin. And then I want you to live daily, abiding and seeing the Spirit. Uh, that's the the four things we went through in in first john 3 19 through 24 and i think those four things are very important to your faith i hope this message has encouraged you i hope you're able to look through this passage and and get some encouragement that it, if you've been beating yourself up or others up that maybe you need to stop and you need to trust the lord's judgment you need to get your heart open and real before the Lord and, and, and say, Lord, I know my life is an open book anyway, but now I'm going to live like it is. His goal for us is confidence before him. That we stop hiding. That we stop trying to look perfect. That we just admit that we're sinners. That, that we're imperfect. That we're uh, not everything we should be, but he is everything. Jesus is everything we should be. You know, one of the things I love throughout the Gospels is, is the, the apostles were always astounded by all the things Jesus knew. Jesus would talk to somebody and he, he knew how many husbands they had had. He knew how many sins that happened. In their life. He knew things that no man could ever know. Why? Because the Lord knows all. And when Peter said to him, Lord, you know all. You know my heart. You know why this happened. You know how badly I feel. Peter said, I am an open book and you know that I love you. Even though I failed. Peter refocused. He focused on the Lord. He accepted that encouragement, and that forgiveness, and he fed the sheep. He lived daily, obeying and obi abiding and seeing the Holy Spirit fall on people as he preached. My friends, that's what I want for my life, and I hope that's what you want for yours. I want to live daily obeying and abiding, and I want to see the Spirit fall on you. I want to see the Spirit move in your life. I want you to be able to reach out and tell me, Chris, I, I had this dream, or I, I, I had this moment with the Lord, or I, I know that the Lord winked at me this week because this happened, and, and it just made the Lord real to me. He's answered something i was praying for he in some way i know how the lord works and i pray all the time for people that that he would encourage your confidence by showing up and showing you something that only you and him could know live daily abiding in him letting him in your home trusting that you're in his seeing the spirit work and knowing that you've been adopted by the blood of christ into a new family a family that is your forever family in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I thank you that you know everything. I thank you that you want us to live in confidence and not weakness. I, I pray that you would help us to refocus on the main things and not to pick at other Christians or ourselves, but to, to wholly go before you and let you convict us and grow us. And that our intention would never be to shove somebody down, but to lift each other up in you. Father, help us to live daily, obeying and abiding and seeing the Spirit. Father, I pray that everybody who watches this is really encouraged by this passage because I believe that's John's intent. He, he's been laying down some hard things, but now he's got to tell the people who are maybe crying out and feeling condemned, no, 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 no. Don't be condemned. Be convicted. And if you're convicted at all of sin, it's good evidence that the Holy Spirit is in your life. Father, I've sat at the altar and when people are crying and they're hurting over a sin they committed, that's the moment I know that they have the Holy Spirit because other people wouldn't feel bad. But your Holy Spirit is convicted and, and changed and is transforming us into something new. And Father, I thank you that you love us too much to let us live the way we used to live. Help anyone watching this to know that they can truly change in you. You're not some program. But you're a real Savior. Who really gave his life for us and who can give us the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives to convict us and to help us to experience your love and forgiveness forever. Father, I thank you that you didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but you came that the world might be saved through you. Help us, Father, to have your peace and have your confidence that we don't have to wonder if we're really saved. We can know it today. In Jesus' precious name, amen.
Well, that's it. I don't know if you've heard my dog whining at me a little bit. I think she needs to go out. Uh, But I, I just want you to know one last time, you don't have to live in doubt. If you've given your life to Christ, it's not your works. It's his. He has forgiven you. You're in a forever family because of him. Now act that way. Live that reality. He knows all and he loves you anyway. He knows all of my flaws and all of my sins, and yet he still loves me so very much. His goal for you is a confident life in Christ. His goal for you is that you would refocus and focus on the main points of of our faith and that we would live daily with him in our home, seeing the Spirit at work in our lives and obeying his ways living as his children. When you're in the Father's house, it's the Father's rules. But they're good, and we're all better for it. My friends, that's it. That's all I've got. I love you, and I hope you're able to come out. Uh, even though the corona is going on, we are still meeting. We've got spacing. Um, I We clean in there uh, and, and aren't in the room much during the week really at all we we kind of shut it off and use it on the weekend so uh very happy uh uh, very clean haven't had any reports of anybody getting sick uh in that area so anyway i love you and i hope to see you soon